Thank you for joining us for this information session. Tonight, we will be discussing the online and part-time graduate programs in technical and engineering management offered through the Whiting School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. My name is Cheryl Williams, and I am the Recruitment and Marketing Specialist for the Whiting School of Engineering. With me tonight is Dr. Tim Collins. Tim is the chair of our technical management and engineering management programs. Since 1996, he has taught at the graduate level in the areas of aviation safety, accident investigation, and aeronautical sciences. He has also served as a guest lecturer on ethics, character development, and aviation technology development with unmanned systems at universities across the country. He is the Chief Government Relations Officer at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, where he oversees governmental relations activities across a 1.5 billion research and development portfolio. Tim, would you like to say hello? Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, it's so great to have everyone with us tonight. I appreciate the very kind words. In these two programs, I am currently teaching uh, project management as well as technical communications and organizations. Great to have everyone tonight, and I can't wait to tell you about these two awesome programs. Over <laughs> to you, Cheryl. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Tim. For tonight's presentation, we'll start off with an introduction to Johns Hopkins Engineering. Next, Tim will discuss with you our degree programs in technical management and engineering management. Then we'll review some helpful information on tuition and payment options, talk about next steps and important dates, and we'll end with a live question and answer session. If you have any questions at any point in the presentation, please type them into the control tab, uh, oh, excuse me, into the questions tab on your control panel. Um, if you are joining us via a cell phone or a tablet, just simply select the question mark to access the question section. We'll address all questions at the end of the presentation. So why study engineering at Johns Hopkins University? Johns Hopkins University was founded in 1876 as the nation's first research university. The School of Engineering opened its doors in 1913. And in 1915, it began offering part-time engineering coursework as night classes for technical workers. Since then, we've grown to offer more than 20 master's programs that can be completed part-time. 16 of these programs can be completed entirely online. Our programs are designed by people who thoroughly understand your industry. We like to say that our programs are for engineers by engineers. Our faculty are all expert and working engineers, and our faculty and instructional designers construct new and update existing coursework every year so that it includes the most up-to-date information. In addition to our part-time programs, the Whiting School of Engineering has over 25 research centers and institutes. This includes our strong partnership with the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland. We also offer uh, full-time bachelor's, master's, and PhD programs in residence at our, our Homewood campus in Baltimore, Maryland. Our online and part-time programs are led by respected senior engineers from our applied physics laboratory and faculty from our full-time programs. We are ranked in the top 25 best online engineering programs by U.S. News & World Report. And of all the schools that are included in these rankings, we actually have the largest online part-time student population. So not only will you have lots of fellow students going through a similar learning experience, but these rankings really speak to the quality of our programs regardless of our size, and our school is experienced and well-equipped to help you navigate graduate education as an online student. The degree that you earn with us part-time is of the same quality as our full-time degree programs. Your diploma will not say online or part-time. You are eligible and highly encouraged to participate in commencement. And as a graduate, you will be one of more than 28,000 Whiting School alumni and will join our esteemed international alumni community. So that is an overview of who we are and the value of our programs. Now Tim is going to talk to you more about our programs in technical management and engineering management. Tim? All right, Cheryl, thank you. I just want to note right there that 
that's not to be underestimated the strength and importance of that alumni network. It is amazing how networking and relationships can have a very direct and positive impact on what you do professionally. And so one of the things that we draw upon are other alum in our program. They teach in our program. And you, of course, as you move through the program, you meet and interact with a variety of people from a variety of industries across the nation and with some international participation. So tonight I'm gonna to talk about these programs. We offer two um, master's degrees that we're gonna talk about tonight, the master's in technical management and engineering management, and I'll talk about the distinctions in a minute. We also offer certificate and post-master certificates. In technical management, if you just need a little top off or in some cases, you know, this is an environment where we're all discovering what lifelong learning means. And so if you have to come back to school to get a little more education to advance your career or to reinforce something you're trying to get done, then we offer that opportunity too. The structure of the two programs is the same in that there are core courses. On the technical management side, we have what's called a focus area that we talk about, and then you have some electives. It's still hold true for the engineering management program as well. And the courses themselves we offer, it's a 10 course program and you have to complete your program in five years. If there is some sort of an issue, um, sometimes we have some military folks with deployments or business people that are find themselves in a difficult situation, we can certainly extend that five years. But we really recommend that when you start, you're ready to start, and just get it done. So we have the one core course, and then you move to these uh, focus areas. You pick which one is of most interest to you or most applicable or aligned with your career goals. We also have um, student advisors that are faculty members. Each student is offered an advisor, and the advisor right at the beginning of your program will help you lay out your program plan. And they can be uh, very influential in helping you decide really which one of these is best suited for where you want to go with your career. But these are the five that make up the technical management. There's courses within those and as well as electives. Uh, as we turn our attention now to engineering management, you can see it's essentially the same. We have some core and then we have some electives. It is also a 10 course program. It is also a program that we encourage you to get it done within five years. Many of our students will start with one course and uh, just go year round. And so you can get this done, you know, three courses a year, you can do the math. Um, some students will take the summers off or they may double up and just try to, you know, get through it as quickly as they can. So we offer courses year round. On the engineering management side, so this is bringing up, this is the core. So five courses, you pick from these five, all engineering management students, participate in the core. I'll just let you scan that list for just a second. And then you choose a concentration that is focused on your technical expertise. So for some students, it might be computer engineering, it might be mechanical engineering, but it's essentially providing you the management education that you need and yet making sure that you're keeping abreast with the changes in your technical field. Our admissions requirements are very straightforward. We do require that you have a bachelor's degree generally in science and engineering. Uh, you know the world is changing and we're finding uh, people in a lot of different sectors where they are mid-career and they're having to actually manage technical programs but perhaps they don't have a technical or engineering bachelor's degrees. So one of the things that we'll ask for in the admissions process is a resume, and that helps us match and make sure that we think that you can succeed in the program. Uh, we do require right now a 3.0 GPA. If uh, you started it off your first couple of years a little slow, but you picked up once you got into your major, excuse me, we absolutely take that into consideration. And then the, probably the the other one that's the most important is we do require you to have professional experience, not experience as an intern, but actually post-undergraduate 
professional experience and two years worth because of the way the courses are structured you're actually learning from your colleagues as well as the engineer faculty member who's guiding the conversation helping you unpack the material but we want you to be grounded in some of these subjects so we know what we're talking about to help you get the most out of the experience that you can. We do not require a GRE or a GMAT for either of the program. Your program can be completed um, online 100%. It can be done on ground. It can be done a combination. We do something that's called virtual live. It's our own term and this is a course that's done online and in the classroom simultaneously. So if you're local or you're close by or you're the kind of uh, student that likes the brick and mortar, likes to sit in the classroom, then you can come be right in the classroom. But we're also telecasting and recording. So if you're caught on the wrong side of town or you can't get there, but you can open up your laptop, you can actually join the class in progress. Or if you need to do this asynchronously because you're on travel, um, the schedule didn't work out, you can't get to class, then you just simply log on to your computer and you can just uh, fly through the recording. It's as if um, you were there. So you can do it in any of those four ways. All of the courses in the technical management can be done online. Most of the courses in the uh, engineering management can also be done online. There are a few depending on your technical specialty or your concentration that may not quite yet be there. For instance, in physics, we are just now, we've just this semester started our first physics course, asynchronous and online. So when I talk about coming to class, uh, two locations, the primary location right now is the Applied Physics Lab, which is in Laurel, Maryland. So it's right between Baltimore and Washington. We have on occasion taught in some of the other locations that you see on the map, but to, um, for the most part, I think in the spring, all of our on-ground classes, which are only um, less than a quarter now of our courses are actually done on ground or in the virtual live, all of them next semester will be here in Laurel. And if we wanna to go to the next slide, I'll turn it back to Cheryl to talk about the money. All right, all right, thank you again, Tim. Now we'd like to share some information to help you take this next step. Some of the most common questions that our admissions team gets from prospective students is what is the tuition and what resources are available to help me pay? So here it is. Our tuition is currently $4,055 a course. Our courses are three credits each. So this is the total tuition cost for each three credit course. Our tuition uh, does fluctuate every year due to inflation. So at this time, we're encouraging students to budget $45,000 total for their degree. But in addition to this tuition, there are no fees that students have to pay on a semesterly basis. So we do not charge students a technology fee along with tuition. Our online and part-time students do not pay, for example, like a student union fee. We also do not charge prospective students uh, a fee to submit their application for admission. So we do not have an application fee. The only fee that our students pay uh, is a fee at the end of their study, uh, end of the course of their study with us, uh, known as a graduate's fee. You have a variety of financing options available to you depending on your personal circumstance. I really encourage you to investigate and to take advantage of any education benefits that your employer may offer. Uh, we, you know, over 90% of our student population is employed and the vast majority of them are receiving some sort of financial assistance from their employer. So I really encourage you to, to contact your supervisor, contact your HR to, department, see what is available for you. If you are a U.S. citizen or a qualifying U.S. resident, you may be eligible to use financial aid. The financial aid that's available for graduate students is largely unsubsidized loans. So similar to that, you can, of course, finance your education through a personal loan. And if you are active duty or retired military and you have benefits, veterans benefits, you can, of course, utilize these to finance your education. We do actually have a number of active duty and retired military enrolled in our online and part-time programs. If you're planning on using veterans benefits, here are some things to keep in mind. 
Uh, the URL that you see here on your screen, ep.jhu.edu backslash veterans, has some great information on what forms you need to complete and to submit in order to utilize veterans benefits here at Johns Hopkins. For students using Chapter 33 post 9-11 benefits, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs sets an annual cap on tuition for private schools. That cap is $21,970.46. And this is actually for an entire academic school year. So it includes the fall, spring, and summer semesters. And then it renews every fall. Five courses, so if you were to take, for example, two courses in the fall, two courses in the spring, and then one in the summer, five courses will come in under that tuition cap. The cost for five courses with us is $20,275. Six courses, however, will exceed the tuition cap. Uh, the cost for six courses is $24,330. Thankfully, Johns Hopkins is a yellow ribbon school. Yeah, how Yellow Ribbon works at Johns Hopkins is that it is applied only if the tuition cap is exceeded. And if it is exceeded, qualifying students can receive $1,000 per year, and it's awarded on a first-come, first-served basis. The last thing uh, here that I wanted to mention on this slide is that the Harry W. Colmery Veterans Educational Assistance Act of 2017, otherwise known as the Forever GI Bill, was signed into law. This law expands on the veterans education benefits offered through Chapter 33 post 9-11 GI Bill. For example, it removes the benefit expiration dates for those who were discharged or released from the military on or after January 1st of 2013. So if this is you, you now have an unlimited amount of time to utilize your veterans education benefits. They do not expire. Buyer. There's actually a lot of really exciting benefits that are rolled up into this bill. Uh, so if you would like more information on the Forever GI Bill, I really just encourage you to visit military.com and search Forever GI Bill. There's some great information on that site. If you are located outside of the U.S. and are interested in studying with us, here are some helpful tips to keep in mind. International students, of course, are welcome to study with us from their home country through our online programs. Whether you study with us on site or online, here are some additional admissions requirements that apply to these students. International students must submit an international credit evaluation of any credit earned at non-U.S. institutions. We prefer that students go through WES. Uh, WES is a third-party credit evaluation, third-party credit evaluation service. So we encourage students to uh, contact that service for, for this evaluation. International students also must submit proof of English proficiency via, for example, qualifying scores on a TOEFL exam. On-site students, in order to maintain their F-1 visa status, students must enroll full-time, the definition of which you can see here on your screen, as well as provide proof of financial support to cover annual living and education exp expenses. Next steps and important dates. So if you're interested in uh, joining one of these two programs, your first step is to submit your application for admissions. You can do that by visiting the URL that you see on your screen, ep.jhu.edu backslash apply. As I mentioned previously, we do not have an application fee. Uh, next, you'll need to submit your academic transcripts as well as your professional resume. Now we do have rolling admissions here at Johns Hopkins for our online and part-time students. And it will typically take our academic department and our admissions department four to six weeks from when they receive an applicant's full application. So the application plus the supplemental materials, uh, four to six weeks to reveal that full packet uh, before they can issue a student a decision letter. So with that in mind, here are some important dates. Our spring registration has already opened. It actually opened on October the 26th. And our spring semester begins on January 29th. So if you are interested in studying with us in our spring 2018 semester, I encourage you to submit your application as soon as possible, ideally well before December the 15th. So that is the end of the prepared portion of this presentation. Now we'd like to open it up to you uh, to answer any questions you may have for Dr. Collins or myself uh, regarding these programs and our admissions process. Okay, so the first question is, what is the difference 
uh, with regards to courses between the graduate certificate and the postmaster certificate? The, um, you know, in both cases, we will help you tailor um, the kind of certificate that you need with the number of courses that you need aligned with the purpose of the certificate. For instance, there are some employers that they would like to see a five course certificate with shows continuing education. Others, you know, a two course certificate. There's also a case where you'll have a master's degree already, and so, but you need an additional certificate. So that's the post master certificate as opposed to just a certificate, which is generally post undergraduate. All right, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, this this attendee's question is: um, Can I select a finance focus within the engineering management program? Or if if, um, if a student no, was think, interested yeah. in in kind of finance related matters, what what perhaps? What would your advice be yeah, for would, that person? Yeah, thank you for the question. So if you're thinking finance related, you, you know, I would turn you towards technical management as your starting point. Remember, engineering management is about a little leadership and then focused on a technical specialty, a concentration. Technical management is more aligned to um, the leadership of managing a variety of projects. One question that, that this sort of leads us to is, you know, what is the difference? So if you're out there in the acquisition domain, perhaps you're a program manager or a project manager, then a technical management program would align with what you wanted to do. If you're a line manager and you have staff that are working on technical problems at a system or component level, then perhaps the engineering management program is better for you. But in this case, you know, the finance concentration, it really is not focused as if it were a master's of business administration like an MBA. Although you'll hear people as you look around and, and do your due diligence, for some, the engineering management degree is sort of the engineer's equivalent of what an MBA would be if you were a straight up finance person. So without looking at your resume and without looking at your transcript, it's a little hard to get after the details of what you're thinking about in terms of a finance concentration. But this is a technical program, it's not a business program. All right, great. Next question. How are classes generally structured to teach students? Are they collaborative, case study based, hands on, lecture, or a mix? Tim, thoughts? Yes, excellent, excellent question. They're a mix. For instance, in the online courses, it's done asynchronously. You'll typically have some reading material. There'll be uh, sh maybe a couple short little video clips that are part of the lecture for a particular week. We are uh, very strong in doing projects and team projects because we think collaborating in the engineering field is uh, absolutely required. And so you'll see a variety of different methods based on the topic and the experience of the faculty in teaching the material. So unlike Harvard, where it's predominantly only one way, which is the case study way, here, I would say it's more mixed methods. Then it's done asynchronously, so you can you know, do it as your schedule allows. For the on-ground courses or the virtual live, it tends to be a little more focused on the lecture format, but in either case, you're, it's very engaging with the students, and we try to, you know, at the graduate level, we try to make it more a discussion and a conversation to leverage the professional experience that the students bring to the material, not just an instructor or a faculty member that's standing up and lecturing for two hours. Cheryl. All right, great. Are there undergraduate course prerequisites for those without an engineering degree? 
but extensive engineering work experience? I, I would have to look at the resume and all that, but generally I will say no. Okay. Uh, this attendee has a question regarding the uh, cyber focus uh, for engineering management. Um, how similar are the classes and content from the Masters of Science in Cybersecurity that uh, we also offer? Yeah, excellent course question. So for each of those focus areas, those are all managed by the program chairs and it's the coursework that's uh, associated with their programs. So for instance, if you only wanted to specialize in cybersecurity and that was where you wanted to go, then I would encourage you to say, well, just look at the cybersecurity program and, and go that way. If you're thinking about this management and this leadership piece, maybe you don't want to just be a technical specialist, or maybe you're thinking about now's the time I want to start to prepare myself for higher levels of responsibility. Maybe I want to be a CIO someday. Then I would say the engineering management might be more appropriate for you. So the five courses or the courses that you would take in the focus area of cybersecurity, you would work with the cybersecurity student advisor to find the exact right set of courses and you would be in class side by side with others who are focused more specialty in just that in just that domain. So for the engineering management, you actually end up with two advisors. You have an advisor for engineering management, which helps you with the core side, and then you have an advisor for, in this case, the cybersecurity side. So the coursework is the same and all we're doing is we're leveraging that work but we're combining it with some academics to prepare you for a different career objective. Cheryl. All right, great. Great, great, great. Uh, this is another great question um, that has to do with uh, the focus, the concentrations within engineering management. Um, can you pick a concentration that is different from the type of engineering that you, you're that you have uh, as your undergraduate engineering degree? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. So, uh, it, and what you said yeah. earlier was that those concentrations are typically aligned with what you are doing professionally as opposed to, correct? Yeah, excellent, Cheryl. Yes, that's a great clarification. So let's say you've got your undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering and you've been professionally working on projects doing uh, optics and photonics, and that really you know, has got you going. And you wanted to take that focus area for your engineering management, that would be fine. So um, you're, if you were a mechanical engineer, an undergraduate, that, that does not restrict you in the Johns Hopkins programs to only being a mechanical engineer at the graduate level. The, the most important part of all that is to just have a scientific engineering background and then we'll look at your resume and again we're we're going to have a very uh, rich conversation because we do not want you to not be successful so we'll we'll work with you and make sure we can align what what we're offering with what your skills are that you bring to the to the classroom Cheryl all right thank you this next question, uh, Tim, I think I can answer. This particular attendee uh, is a U.S. resident but earned a uh, their bachelor's degree or a degree abroad. Um, do I apply as an international student? Uh, what I want to say is that it's r regardless of whether or not you are uh, a U.S. citizen or, uh, you know, a citizen of another country, you're filling out the same application. Um, so it's, you'd be filling out exactly the exact same um, online application as you would regardless. Um, the, those, qual those additional admissions requirements uh, do correspond to the country that you were, that you received your education in. So in this particular regard, uh, because you did earn 
a, uh, a degree abroad, you would have to get an international credit evaluation of that degree. Um, so you'd have to contact Wes and work with them to obtain that document and then have an official copy of that sent to our admissions department. And we would actually use that credit evaluation as your transcript um, to be included with your application. In terms of the TOEFL requirement, um, it, you know, depending on your, you, you know, if you're a U.S. citizen, there's there's actually a, a TOEFL waiver process. So, uh, for example, if you were educated abroad and then you you did come to the U.S. and are a natural, nationalized uh, citizen and have been here for years, um, there there is a process uh, if you would like to petition for a waiver. And you can find the information on that process if you go to our website, ep.jhu.edu, and slick on, click on the admissions, I think it's like the admissions and financial aid tab, uh, there should be some information there. So if you, I'd encourage you to kind of look into that. Uh, let me know if there's any additional part of that that you have questions. All right, Tim, the next question for you. What are typical time requirements per week per course? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. I want to say it's 10 to 20 hours. Okay. Per course. And that that is inclusive of basically. So if you're thinking about an online course that's inclusive of all the time that you would spend watching the recorded lectures. Uh, and doing the readings and participating in the discussions and things of that nature. Correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. The next question says here, are fewer courses offered during the summer semester with respect to the fall and spring? So are there limited course offerings in the summer semesters? Uh, yes, there are. There are fewer courses. It's not as uh, rich or diverse. That is uh, driven by faculty availability as well as student interest, that we just don't usually have the same level of students in the summer that we do in the fall and the spring. And it's also the, the uh, summer is a compressed schedule. So we run a 14-week, 14 14-module 14 a semester in the fall and the spring and it's anywhere from 11 to 13 depending on how this, the summer works out so it tends to be a little more demanding in the summertime so but there are fewer classes yes okay Cheryl all right great this next question um, an attendee has a question about 700 level coursework so uh, we say online and in our catalog that uh, both of these programs require a 700 level elective. Um, and so this attendee would like to know a little bit more about how to determine whether or not something is at the 700 level. So we don't want to get into too much of the technical details, but you can tell that by the numbering system that we have. And the way to think about it is a 400 level course is basically a graduate level course where the only requirements are that you have an undergraduate degree. In other words, there will not be any prerequisites. For our 700 level courses, you'll typically find a graduate level prereq is required because it is an advanced graduate course. So there aren't near as many 700 level courses as there are 400 level courses. And as a byproduct of the fact that you generally have to have some graduate work completed already, you won't really deal with the 700 courses until you're about halfway through the program. Cheryl. Great. Great, great, great. And so um, the other, if I could just add to that, if you're looking at the numbering system of these courses, the first three numbers before the decimal point are actually aligned to the program, um, whereas the final three numbers after the decimal point will tell you the level of the course. So for example, under, uh, you know, technical management, under organizational management, the core courses, uh, 
762, which is the management of technical organizations, is a 700 level course. Is that correct, Tim? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay. So, it, it, you know, we just, no need to get too technical on it right now. Okay. All right. Just FYI. Um, so, we have, give me two moments to, to read a couple of these questions, Tim, and I'll be right back with you. So while she's uh, reading that, those questions, just want to remind uh, folks, you know, if you want to enroll, but periodically you have to, you know, be gone for a couple of weeks, because most of our classes are online, if you do have these extended travel periods, you can simply work with your instructor on a case-by-case -case basis for completing the work. We totally understand the flexibility needed for the professional part-time graduate student. So don't let that deter you from pursuing an advanced degree because you have a dynamic schedule. Everyone has a dynamic <laughs> schedule. That's just the way it is today. Okay, Cheryl, are you ready with another one? I am, I am. Uh, does engineering management, uh, do we have, do our, do, do these programs or uh, Johns Hopkins in general have existing ties with aerospace companies? If so, which ones? And so, so with these two programs, yeah. Oh, I I'm was going to say, I was going to break this down a little bit, you know, in terms of maybe, uh, you know, faculty or representation in, in aerospace companies, um, as well as I'm, I'm wondering if they're, uh, this attendee is thinking about like professional networking situations. Yeah, so um, I'll pull that thread first. And so, yes, we have students from all kinds of sectors. Uh, across the United States, defense sectors, health sectors, business sectors. Um, in these two programs, we don't currently do any on-ground, cohort-aligned programs on-site with any of the major corporations in the country. We've done this before with Hopkins. There are there's um, our systems engineering program is just completing one with Raytheon, I think, but currently we don't have one. We are in some discussions with some, and this is the idea where uh, industry invites us to come. They gather their employees. They put together a cohort. We actually bring the faculty, bring the material, teach on ground at the company's location, and they do it as a convenience to their, to their employees. I will uh, also say that there, Hopkins is very familiar from a financial point of view of dealing with companies, businesses, in terms of handling the finances. So I can't think of a case, Cheryl, maybe you can, but for the most part, students don't handle the money. They just uh, provide the paperwork that's required by their employer. Hopkins works with the employer's accounting and finance people and all the financial transactions are happening in the background. Are you, are you talking about for cohorts? So if like a company has a cohort of students enrolled in a program, how that financial piece is handled? Yeah, it, actually in both cases, right? It, it, um, if they're like it a can student. happen that way. The, Go ahead. So um, it really depends upon the company and the level of, okay. of benefit offered uh, by that company, um, the you know, and th this might be a separate topic um, altogether, but I'm happy to talk about it if people are interested. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you should. You know, go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. So the um, there are some companies, especially in like cohort situations, that may just take care of the financing of the uh, the program um, as part of the partnership agreement. Um, if it's if, if students are enrolling like on a one to one basis, a lot of times what they will have to do is um, consult what their company's you know education benefit policy is. A lot of times it's a reimbursement, uh, and if that's the case, uh, the student will have to uh, pay upfront, um, get the you know the qualifying grade 
uh, to receive their reimbursement and then submit their grades uh, to their company in order to receive kind of that uh, that reimbursement from them to reimburse them for the 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 fee the, not the fees the tuition for the course. Um, you do have the option, uh, you, you know, typically what happens is that students pay at the beginning of the course, like, or even before the course begins, but there is an option, like a late fee option, I think of like $150 that would allow students to pay later. And that might give a student the option to kind of defer payment until they receive that reimbursement from their, their company. Uh, so in that situation, there would be a fee, even though I talked, you know, earlier that uh, we typically don't charge our students fees. But in that situation, that, that would be a fee. So it, I don't know. In short, in short, I would say it really depends upon uh, what type of benefit your company offers. Is it a reimbursement? Is it tuition assistance? If it's tuition assistance, then the company would just pay for it up front. If it's reimbursement, then then they are reimbursing you for what you're paying. Does that make sense? It does. Yes. Thank you for the clarification. Sure. 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 And so, uh, and Tim, to, to to further kind of pull on this this thread, you're saying that we we also have faculty that are represented in uh, do we do we have aerospace related faculty? Absolutely. We have faculty from a variety of sectors. We have students from a variety of sectors. Um, absolutely. Okay. This is one of the strengths of the program, frankly, is that the the faculty, as Cheryl mentioned at the beginning, are working engineers. These are people that are out here, you know, working on projects and in programs every single day. So when you're talking about the financial contractual course, these are people that, you know, they understand what an RFP is, they're actually doing SOWs, all the rest of that. So and they come from a variety of different experiences which we think enriches the educational experience for the student. Cheryl. Sure. Um, this next question I think is a, is a question that, uh, that I can answer by myself. And by the way, that previous attendees whose questions we just answered, if we haven't fully answered your question, please feel free to chat us back in. Um, with additional questions. All right. This next question says, uh, can you apply to the spring? 2018 semester with the intention of doing uh, refresher classes, but actually start the graduate program in the summer or fall of 2018? Absolutely. So what, what I'll say here is that once you submit, once you're admitted, you actually have up to three semesters to begin your study with us. We would obviously, we would love it for you to start, you know, in your admit term. Um, and the sooner you can start and stay continuously enrolled and keep that momentum up, uh, the better. Um, but yes, you you absolutely can apply for the spring and maybe in the spring take some refresher courses as needed um, and then uh, begin, you know, your coursework in, in later semesters. Um, it, is up, it is up to you. But if you were to apply to the spring semester, you would need to enroll um, by the fall in order to maintain your student status. All right. Uh, all right, Tim, here's another question for you. Are you ready? I'm ready. OK. How soon after being accepted do you need to declare a focus, a concentration area, uh, or do you have to decide one when you apply? Once you start, are you able to switch? Tim, talk to us about that process. Yes. Okay, so the process is once you're admitted to technical management, then you'll be uh, put with a, an advisor, and between the two of you, you'll actually develop a program plan. You'll lay out the roadmap for how you're going to complete your degree, when you're going to take what courses, how it's going to go. So in that sense, you're sort of making an initial declaration, if you will. We don't really view it as a declaration. You can change at any time. You still have to, you know, meet the meet the course requirements. But for instance, in the technical management, 
you know, there's five courses that you have to take in the core before you flip over to your focus area. So five courses generally takes people about a year to get done. So as you're taking courses and you're talking to other students and you're thinking about it, you know, then when you're ready to start working on your focus area, then you can make the adjustment at that time. No problem. All right. Cheryl. Wonderful. It looks like we have come to the end of our questions. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you so very much for your time this evening. Thank you for all of this great information. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees this evening for, for joining us, for spending a little bit of your evening with us. Thank you for your interest in our programs. Absolutely, Cheryl. Thanks for uh, putting this together for us. And to all of you, as you think about your program and you think about your education, I just really want to reinforce what Cheryl said. You know, um, a lot of people procrastinate. I just encourage you to think hard. The time is never exactly right. Um, sometimes you think it'll be easier a year or two down the road, but then the job changes, responsibilities change, families grow, change, and it actually gets harder and harder. So um, good luck. Please do feel free to email me directly, email Cheryl. If you have a follow-on question tonight, tomorrow, next week, whatever, um, we're happy to help you uh, find your way. So good luck and uh, thank you for your interest, Cheryl.